In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 11 through 13. Now, the only setup that you really need to know for this particular passage of Scripture is that Samuel has gone to Jesse's house in Bethlehem. And he has gone there for the express purpose, well, not the express purpose, because he actually does have another side purpose that they just kind of conjured up to make sure <laughs> that uh, Samuel was not killed by King Saul. Little, little pretense going on there. But David is not in the house with Samuel and his father and his brothers. And Samuel has already decided that he's going to go ahead and pick who is going to be out of Jesse's sons, who is going to be the Lord's anointed. And he goes over all of his brothers, and uh, several of them are handsome and good-looking, and Samuel's like, surely it's got to be this one, right, Lord? And the Lord each time tells him, nope, that's not the one I've chosen. Nope, pass him over. And so they go through this seven times, seven sons, and then this little episode happens between Jesse and Samuel, and the rest, as they say, is history. So let's look at Samuel 16, verses 11 through 13, where it says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy, with beautiful eyes and handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon, the, upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, a couple things that I want you to really pick up on on this story. This is our introduction to the character of David, one of the most significant characters in the entire Old Testament. And without a doubt, Israel's greatest king and the one that establishes the lineage of Christ and every single legitimate heir, and this is something that is observed even by the Jews to this day, there is no such thing as a legitimate heir to David's throne. There is no such thing as a legitimate king in Israel unless he be of the seed of David. And that remains true to this day. Now, of course, there is a heir of the seed of David on the throne of Israel and the rest of the world too, and his name is Jesus Christ, but, you know, the Jews don't, don't see it that way. But the point is, that standard is established here. From here on throughout now to the end of time, only an heir of David is allowed to be king in Israel. And so this is a very, very significant event in Israel's history. And so I find it fascinating that this is the introduction we're given to David. Where's David? He is tending his father's flocks. How profound is that? The man that eventually becomes, and of course he's the ancestor of Christ now, but we, we can see all that through hindsight, but the man who sets the stage for the coming of the Savior of the world, the very first time we ever get to see him, we, we get to see who David is, he is tending the flocks of his father. I mean, you couldn't plan that better. This is one of the uh, hundreds and hundreds of internal truths that the Bible is something that was, from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, penned by the finger of God himself. Yes, he did it through the inspiration of mortal men, but there's just no way that a human being could have come up with all of this, that this would have fit together so perfectly, that this person who eventually, his lineage will bring about the Messiah, which, by the way, means anointed one, so we, we're seeing the anointing of David in this first little episode, that his first introduction is, well, he's a shepherd and he's taking care of the flocks that are owned by his father, and that's why he's not with his brothers. I mean, that's about as profound as it gets. Remember that Jesus left his family 
I mean, he didn't abandon them, but he did leave them behind to go to his ministry, and that's the introduction we get to adult Jesus. Of course, there's the nativity, and then we get a brief glimpse of him as a young man. But when we're looking at the story of Christ, the earliest thing that we see from him other than his childhood is he's going out away from his family to tend to the sheep of his father. And so this being the way that the character is introduced is incredibly, incredibly significant. So what are the things that we learn about David from this little episode? Well, first, he's not highly esteemed. There's a reason everybody else is at the big special dinner with the big special dinner guest, and David's not. It's not because Jesse didn't love his son. It's not because he, you know, had some kind of animosity towards David or anything like that. It just boils down to the fact that he's the youngest. That's all it is. He just happens to be the youngest son, and they needed somebody to go out there and attend the flocks, and so when you're the youngest, you get the short end of the stick sometimes. And it's not really as true in our society today, but it certainly was back then. That was just the culturally accepted thing to do, is that the youngest, you know, sometimes you got the shaft being the youngest, and that's the reason that he's out there. So he's not highly esteemed or thought of as as being... Uh, significant or special among his brothers. That's the reason he's not with them there. That's pretty Christ-like. And then you've also got the fact that he's a shepherd. We've already talked about that. Jesus becomes the good shepherd. That's actually, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the symbol that was used early on by Christianity is not the cross. The earliest symbols of Christians, and, and early Christians were really, really into symbols, Uh, The earliest symbols used by Christians were the Jesus fish that we're all accustomed to now. And the most common and most popular one was actually an image of Jesus with a lamb around his neck. And there's several reasons why. I mean, first of all, he is the lamb, the sacrificial lamb of God. And then you also have the idea that he is the good shepherd, so the one that leaves the ninety and nine and, and brings the lost sheep back. And so the fact that Jesus is, you know, thought of as a shepherd, especially by his earliest disciples, and that's the symbol that they most related to when they were talking about Christ, and the fact that he is the son of David, he is the, the ultimate uh, ancestor of David, and he's in that lineage, that's not a, a mistake. And on top of that, we also see that he's a dutiful son. I'm sure that David, if given the choice between tending the sheep and going and having the di- having dinner with a prophet that has come to visit his father, like, if he gets his choice, he's probably going to go with the dinner, I would imagine. But you know what? He chooses to work. Jesse asked him to take care of his sheep, or, or one of his older brothers, who, I, you know, would have had the authority to do so, and because they have the authority of his father, or his father himself asked him this, he goes out and tends his father's flocks. He is a dutiful son. He is one that cares about his father. He is one that keeps the commandments, honors his father, just like it says in the Ten Commandments, and goes forth and does this. So you see a lot of Christ symbolism woven into this very, very brief introduction. We've only read three verses. And look at how much lines up with Christ already. And so let's get into one thing that is kind of different about David and Christ in this little introduction. Why is David handsome? It makes note here, and it goes through this story, if you watch the previous episode that we did, where we were talking about how God said, um, no, don't don't pick the the big attractive one that's the oldest, I think Elihu is is his name, says "Don't, don't pick him because he's attractive and because he's tall and good looking like Saul was, you're looking at the outward appearance, I want you to look at the heart. And God says that I'm the one looking at the heart, and yet, interestingly enough, The Bible, just a few verses later, goes out of its way to say, oh, and and by the way, this David character, yeah, he's uh, ruddy, which means red. By the way, that was an attractive feature. It's kind of like saying a a woman is fair, uh, and that was a, a term of endearment. Ruddy is kind of the same thing, and it says he's ruddy, he's handsome, and he has beautiful eyes. Well, I mean, you know, it's describing David as a very handsome individual that you would desire, but God was still looking at the heart. Yes, David did have outward beauty, but God didn't care about that. You see, Samuel was going to pick, basically, based on that alone, 
and God says, no, I'm looking at the heart, and yet his selection happens to be a person that is good looking. But that's not the reason that he picked them. That's the difference. Samuel was going to pick the oldest one because he was good looking. God happens to pick a good looking boy, but it's not because he's good looking. God is still judging him based on his heart, which I think should lead us to believe that attractiveness is not a bad thing. But it's also something that God just isn't all that concerned with. Maybe he is in some sense, and, and I don't mean, and I'm going to explain myself in a second. I'm not saying that, you know, God favors attractive people like a human would. But maybe it's important to God for a certain task in certain ways. But ultimately, God's just not all that concerned with that. And I think that that's the example that we ought to follow, is that, yeah, we can notice it. Yeah, it can be useful from time to time. But ultimately, we shouldn't really be focused on it, and we shouldn't be making decisions based on that. But we also can't go too far the other way and think that attractiveness is a bad thing. David was a very attractive person, and he also had a very good heart. God was more concerned with the heart part, but he wasn't bothered by the fact that David happens to be an attractive individual. But that is a contrast between him and Jesus, because Isaiah 53, 2 specifically comments on this and says that there's nothing about Jesus that was particularly attractive or significant in any way that would suggest that he's something that men would be drawn to because of his physical appearance. And yet with David, it, it points out that, yeah, actually David was. He was a, a good-looking man, or, in, you know, in this part of the story, a good-looking boy. But I think one of the reasons that that is true is that God, you know, created David just like he created Christ's physical body as well. And so if one's attractive and one's not, I think that we can draw a lesson from that. You see, David led a worldly kingdom. And whether we like it or not, people tend to look up to leaders that are good-looking. I mean, I wish that they didn't, but you can tell this, and this is where the advantage of me being a political guy comes in. Normally, politics can be settled based on who's the more attractive candidate. I remember that, uh, I believe it was John Stossel that did this exercise where he did a survey and he used local politicians in places that they would not have been running, so they would have been unknown to the people he was talking to. And he went through, and he just asked the people, okay, which of these two people do you think is more attractive? And with something like an 85% success rate, those people who had never seen these people before in their life were able to pick the person that won the contest based solely on who was the more attractive looks play a pretty significant role in human interaction, especially when picking leaders. It probably shouldn't, but it does. And so, when we consider that, maybe that's why God made David handsome. Because he knew David, who was going to be running a physical worldly kingdom here in Israel and was going to do so for many years, that would give him kind of an edge, and that would make him better equipped to do the task that God had assigned for him in life. So, why didn't Jesus get that? Because Jesus rules a spiritual kingdom, where that's just not that important. Jesus didn't need to be attractive. Jesus didn't need to be somebody that people would naturally gravitate to because of his appearance, because A, he had a, a natural gravitas with people, a natural charisma with people based on who he was rather than what he looked like. But more importantly than that, Jesus just simply didn't need that because his kingdom was a spiritual one. He is ruling the kingdom of heaven. He didn't need physical appearance to do that. He didn't need that to accomplish the task that God had given to him. So, what we can look at this story and see is that David had everything that he needed to do the task that God had given him, and so did Jesus. They needed different things, but ultimately, they were both men that fulfilled God's purpose in their life. Jesus perfectly, David imperfectly, but ultimately, God gave them everything they needed to do what he sent them to earth to do. And you know what? He's given us everything that we need to do the same. Stay the course, friends. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. 
This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.